everyone, this is Caillou back for an episode of Moxtober Daily Wrap-Ups. Moxtober is a month-long event in which each day has a prompt, and then you design cards based on those prompts, we collect them and then review them. You can find a list of the prompts in the description, as well as like a folder containing an MSC set file with all of the previously created cards. So today's prompt is Mithril, and I'm joined by a special guest today, Juliet from the Beacon of Pre Creation podcast. Hi, I'm Juliet. You can find me at Mousewife Games on Twitter and Edicio. I'm a community mod over at Beacon of Creation, so check out that podcast if you haven't yet. Yeah, good to have you on. Um, I definitely I've like seen and talked and like talked uh, a little bit about with like some of the other Beacon of Creation members. So it's just it's good to like have more of them on the show because mm -hmm. the community the community is great and. Um, do you want to talk about uh, quickly about Jumpstart Remixes, your project? Oh, sure. Um, so I think Jumpstart is a really great format and might be a good choice to fundamentally replace Booster Draft forever. Um, I mean, not saying people couldn't do Booster Draft, but it's like a thing you do on your own, like Winston Draft. I, um, <laughs> I, to that end, I, one of the things I'm working on right now for Moxtober is, uh, because restrictions breed creativity, a card a day based on the Moxtober prompts, but within a jumpstart redesign of only Dragon's Maze cards and art, uh, which is a lot to try to do. But I thought I have these ideas about what multicolor and hybrid mean in a jumpstart setting. Uh, and Ravnica is a great place to dive like right in because you've got 10 guilds, you have a lot of multicolor cards to try to do, and that's not something that Jumpstart did uh, a lot of. But you can hear a lot more of my Jumpstart ideas on the Jumpstart Beacon episode. It's just a few weeks ago, so it should be pretty recent in the podcast feeds. Okay, cool. And do you want to start us off with the first card we're going to be discussing? Um, sure. Let's go for Ingot of Mithril. And here's where I don't remember. Because the cards appear on screen, do I read the card text or just... You can read it if you want. I, us I usually read them just because it, hel it helps me... Rem it, it gives me a second to think, oh god, wait, I've kind of forgotten what this card does, though. Sure. Uh, Ingot of Mithril is a two-mana artifact treasure with... Sacrifice Ingot of Mithril, add one mana of any color, and Sacrifice Ingot of Mithril, add two colorless mana. If this mana is spent on an equipment spell, it enters the battlefield with an indestructible counter on it. Yeah, I like this a lot. Um, I think what we're going to be seeing is that Mithril was like super evocative of equipment for a bunch of people, so no surprises there. But I almost feel like if you remove the Sacrifice from the first one and made this like three mana... Um, this would be like, uh, this, this could be like a really cool like uh, thing on Uncommon where it's like you're drafting and you're like, oh, this is just a mana rock. Sometimes I need that fixing slash ramp. But then if you're an equipment deck, it's like, oh, okay, this is like, this is something I should pick higher. So just mm -hmm. from like a environment perspective, I was just, because I, I, I was thinking about it, how similar it looks to like the mana rocks we sometimes see. So if you made this three mana and took sacrifice off the first ability, would you take sacrifice off the second ability? Interesting question. I'm not sure, honestly. I like my gut is not to just because like um, ramping two is strong and giving indestructible is also strong. But like, I don't know. Did mm -hmm. like it, it depends on what the equipment look like in the set and how many destroy target artifacts like that you need to counter that equipment versus destroy creature type things. Yeah, it also it doesn't require you to use it on an equipment spell. So which which is also because I, I don't want it to just be like. Um, oh, you're right. I hadn't noticed that. I just like, oh, duh, one and one. This mana should be spent on equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, so that makes it a little bit hard. Because then, like, is uh, how much is Thrawn Dynamo three or two? I'm just, or no, uh, Weathered Power Stone, I think is what I'm thinking of at three. Ooh, but yeah. That, yeah, in that case, I definitely think the, the sacrifice makes a lot of sense. Um, and I like the, it's like you're using it up. And I like how it has the treasure type line. Um, and so it, it, it like, it feels like that thing of like, you got to spend it or like cash it in, which I, I kind of love, I, I kind of love this as 
like dark steel ingot, but like what dark steel ingot might should be, because it, dark steel and ingot like like it yeah, should like, be like something dark that you steel can is use. literally like is is yeah. mithril. <laughs> exactly. I, it's just funny that we already have dark steel ingot as the name of a card. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, so I think yeah, I talked about how um, it is something that like was. Uh, super evocative for people but i think also i didn't know this actually and i feel i feel like i'm i lose some uh nerd cred for this but i didn't know that the origin of mithril was lord of the rings i read it but i read it a long time ago and i kind of just assumed it was one of those like mithril was one of just those fantasy metals but we mm -hmm. have a lot of lord of the rings designs today um and one of my favorites is dig too deep um so one red mana you sacrifice a land get to add three mana of any color so very powerful ritual and it's instant speed too but your opponent gets to make a five five demon with flying and indestructible so you better be like getting something really good with that mana you or you better be like storming off otherwise your opponent can untap and like really put the pressure on you so a question i have with cards like this i mean i, I love the card you know straight up um is if you have this in let's say a standard environment does this lead to more reasonable combo decks or just more like unstoppable, like less interaction combo decks? Because um, you, you watch some, some decks that combo off and they're really getting in there for just exact, or they're really like dependent on some N minus some number of blockers in order to be able to get their, their full combo damage and it's like okay well i'm going to be getting this this ritual here and giving my opponent this five five flyer which means this can only enable combos that a five five flyer isn't going to get in the way of if that makes sense um obviously like this provides counterplay built into the card because of the the uh the flying demon token that your opponent gets to create. But whenever there's this kind of trade-off there, I think, well, does this does this eliminate the safer to interact with combo decks? Yeah, I almost wonder if like instead of indestructible, maybe the demon has like spells your opponent's cast costs an additional two life to cast. Something like that. So it like it naturally stymies your ability to like storm off with it and forces you to like use it in a fair way or yeah you, you can't like ignore the board because other because like I, I think the biggest thing is like storm can just be like oh okay you have a five five that's cute and then just keep going off so having something like that could make this like a real drawback i think mm -hmm. uh the other thing i'll say uh in, you know we'll probably see some other dwarf cards but i always got uh mithril and ithildin confused it turns out Ithildin is the elf thing made from the same raw materials, and Mithril is the dwarf one. I was was like, oh right, Mithril, the elf steel stuff that Frodo got when he hung out with the elves, but that's not actually the the origin of Mithril. Oh, interesting. I feel like for me, like Mithril, adamantium, it's all in this like realm of like cool fantasy metal. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's kind of the the ansible of of fantasy, super light yeah. uh, glitter gray. <laughs> I just I, I like the idea that it's just very aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Like yes, I will wear mithril not because it it not just because it'll save me from crazy demons that want to kill me, but also because it's kind of a look. Why don't we take a look at part of the forge? It's an artifact for one in a red with a few different abilities. It enters the battlefield tapped and taps for one red. Uh, it has one in a red tap, put a mold counter on another target artifact you control, and four and two red tap, create a token that's a copy of another target artifact you control with a mold counter on it. This is really cool. I think I, I could see this in like... A... 
not like a maybe not like a vintage or legacy cube but like i think like in a lower powered cube this could be really cool in like an artifacts shell because like a two mana like mana rock that isn't like bad it's actually like pretty reasonable and then you get like you can start like uh uh using it to great late game utility this is uh, this is uh and it's super flavorful too so i, I love it it's a little funny to me that this can never fix for red uh it can fix for double red uh, but you already need to have had one red to put the um, fire diamond of it into play. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I really like the idea of making a mold of artifacts and then making a copy from that mold. I think that's a, a really flavorful thing to to build out from. Mm -hmm. I, and it makes me wonder, like, could you do like, um, maybe not a cycle, but but something like, like hot, like maybe like heart of the forest, and then you have like a like a nest counter, and you can like nurture creatures or something. I could see like a, a pseudo cycle, maybe. Sure, even just like a mirror. I'm trying to think of an, a good third thing to copy. Uh, heart of the spark. Ooh. <laughs> put a <laughs> put a spark counter on. A, I don't know. Uh, you know, duplicating planeswalkers, but then why are you duplicating your planeswalker? <laughs> That's usually not a great idea. Obviously, spark double. Um, you just have to include that kind of language in it. Or we just we just wait until they start printing non-legendary planeswalkers, and then you can go ham with it. Yeah. Uh, uh, put a put a scribe counter on target saga, like. You're you're transcribing it so that you can just keep retelling the saga over and over again. Oh yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Um, yeah, actually, I like the idea of that. I think that you yeah you could do that even outside of like the cycle maybe. Um, if you had like an if we had another set with sagas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then last but not least for the the black one, it's um, gosh, I, uh, put a contagion counter on target counter. Uh, and then create another one of those counters. Like oh your... wow, the proliferate. <laughs> uh, it's just like a wildly uh, overbearing way of doing proliferate. Yeah, like can you even put counters on counters? Like I don't even I don't I don't know how rules work. Don't 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 Let's rules don't not interact outside of silver border. <laughs> yeah, fair. Speaking of a design that I think, well, I guess this isn't really silver border. This is entirely mechanically black border, but I thought it was funny. And so I'm just going to use that as my transition. It's or surveyor. Um, and like, so you like you mentioned, like we had lots of like dwarf uh, designs for this one, but I like this, this simple goblin who's just like, well, there's no way to tell if it's mithril without tasting it. So I'm just going to take a chomp into it. And if it's mithril, you get a treasure token. If not, you just get a lowly rock. I love this kind of uh, create different artifacts at random thing. I think that's a that's a fun core mechanic, and the flavor is is fun. I agree. It it kind of leans in silver border type of type of silliness, but it's not like we haven't seen some of that in black border goblins already. Yeah, um, goblins actually be like the butt of too many jokes. Like I feel like I like fr free my free my goblins. L let them let them do cool stuff too. The thing that I would probably change is I would make this an orc because if you've got something called or surveyor, I'm gonna oh. think oh that, that's that's an orc. It has capital O R and then a small curvy letter after it. Uh, that's just. That's just me thinking that. Oh, this is card is orc surveyor. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I didn't, I didn't key to that, but that's definitely something that, uh, and like, looks vaguely orc like too. Or orcs are just goblins, but buff. Don't at me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the next design you want to talk about? Let's look at another ingot, ingot of Velis Vale. It's a tribal artifact shapeshifter for a single colorless mana with changeling and one tap, sacrifice this, search your library for a tribal equipment card and put it onto the battlefield. Then shuffle your library. It's um, 
it's kind of a stretch because it's a card that has tribal and looks for other tribal things, which is not something we mechanically do much. But uh, I'm a big Morning Tide um, aficionado, and I love like the tribal equipments are not that strong, and so this as a way to kind of pull those out is a fun way to make them a little less uh, risky to play. Dog, I didn't even know actual tribal equipment existed when I read this card. I was like, oh, that's cool. Like that's like it's, it's like one of those cards that like uh. Where they where they talk about contraptions, where like it's they'll print it later and and for and then you can just be flavorful. And now you're like blowing my mind because I'm like they already printed them. Uh, speaking of contraptions and tribal, uh, rigor and tribal should both have been super types. Uh, don't at me. Um, uh, but yeah, the uh, there's the cycle of class based equipment in Morning Tide. Uh, you know the the uh, warrior, soldier, shaman, rogue, that that cycle. They're fine. They're fun. They're kind of casually cards for the most part. Uh, there is some combo you can do with the shaman one, but it's easier to do with other cards anyways. And Velis Vale, of course, is the, you know, the place that the changelings come from canonically. Okay, cool. That's all lore from like, before I started playing the game, so mm -hmm. I think I like I didn't have the chance to like learn about it as much. So it's cool to hear about it. It's lore from lore. Lorwin, a. <laughs> okay, so the next card I want to talk about is every day. Um, I talk about these because they're they're always lovely, and that's Cajun's Moxes. So yes. Mox Mithril. So, like. Cajun is taking Moxtober literally and is designing a Mox for each day. And they all are surprisingly pretty reasonable, as reasonable as Moxes can be. This one, though, I think is on the stronger end of the ones that he's designed so far. Um, it's indestructible and has add white, but you can spend it only to cast spells with indestructible. So I didn't like scryf all this, but I'm like, I definitely think that this one has more utility than some of the others. Like there's probably good indestructible spells out there that you can actually turbo out. Right. I agree that this whole set of mocks is, is interesting. This one, you know, indestructible for a while was kind of, okay, well, it's going to cost one extra. Um, that was kind of how it was priced into a lot of the dark steel artifacts for a while. So this kind of offsets that extra one the it's not often that things key off of indestructible in a real way especially for non-creatures and so this making indestructible into a deck is very cool whatever balance it may or may not have that on its own gives a double thumbs up from me yeah i think it itself having indestructible could be like assuming that this is like a, a in eternal formats um where by force is I is I believe played in like sideboards pr primarily for like shops and stuff. I'm not super familiar on like eternal meta, so if like I just butchered that, let me know. But I think that this having indestructible to be able to uh, dodge that could be relevant. Sure. Yeah, I I hadn't been thinking about the occasions when your opponent is running artifact removal and would want to target this as opposed to all the other stuff in your deck. The real then question is. You don't play this without other indestructible things, just as in indestructible mocks. So how much are you weakening the rest of your deck to put the other indestructible cards in so that this isn't dead mana? Yeah, kind of a trade-off there. But that's but I love it because it just it's like brew with this, and I'm like, sure, I will I will go on this wild ride. Mm-hmm. Going off of that, uh, let's take a look at Moxin Miner. It's one in a red for a creature dwarf scout with tap, exile a land card from a graveyard, and sacrifice a land, create a mox ruby token. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Like, very flavorful, but also, like, the power level is there. Because, like, assuming you're in a format with fetches, you can, like, plop this down and then start using it as, like, su like pseudo ramp for like a, or for, like, a single turn. 
Um, also, if like if you're like in a wildfire deck, you don't mind cashing in your lands for a uh, ruby for like rubies because that's actually good because they won't get destroyed by your wildfires. So. Mm. Yeah, I think I'd have to see how this is in cubes that do wildfire, burning of genie sort sort of things. But on the face of it, it's a fun version of a red mana dork. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, because you might be getting one mana per per turn out of it on top of everything else from sacrificing an already tapped land. Yeah, and I like the idea that, like, Moxon is the MTG world's equivalent of um, kind of, like, the MacGuffin metal. Um, I know, like, Lorado, uh, which is a, a Wild West set, in its version of the Gold Rush, had basically, like, the Moxon Rush, where, like, I don't, th- I don't think it was called exactly that, but basically the idea that, like, Moxon was a valuable resource analogous to gold, that, like, various, uh, like, I guess, like, company interests were like mining in the in like Lorado so I thought that was super cool as like oh yeah it has this very like distinctly MTG feel to it it's not just porting an existing trope setting it's kind of got like a little bit of flavor so I I like that Mm -hmm. okay so the next card I want to talk about is uh Sharza Mithril Scaled so I think this this takes the kind of like protection kind of theme that we've seen from other like from the mithril equipments and stuff and is putting it on well okay yeah dragons can sometimes just be like uh can have metal for scales why not and so whenever a colorless permanent you control becomes a target of a spell or ability you can either counter it unless its controller pays two or if it's your own you can copy that spell or ability and you may choose new targets for the copy um i don't hmm. i don't know if that second one goes infinite i feel like Reading it, I feel like I have little alarm bells, but I'm, I'm sure there's a way you can word it where that doesn't happen. But it's still a super cool effect, because I like the idea that the scales can help or harm, depending on what source the the target is coming from. Yeah, the idea that this is, you know, silvered steel, it's it's either really resistant, in which case you have to pay extra mana to pierce through, or it's just straight up reflective, like like silvered like a mirror. Um, that's a really fun idea that it's either harder or reflective. And I could see that kind of pair of things put in a few other places in, in a set if you wanted like a vertical cycle of, I don't know, mithril things together. Yep. And I think that like non-Eldrazi colorless commanders are always appreciated. So I, I think this would probably be cool for commander. Yeah, I I kind of always question, okay, well, it's a colorless dragon. Is it related to Ugin? Which doesn't have to be. Like, could just be a, a person who is a dragon somewhere and doesn't deal with the colors of mana. Yep. Okay, do you want to move on to the next card? Sure. Let's look at Gilded Great Shield. It's and equipment for one in a G with equipped creature gets plus O plus two and has trample and equip one in a green. So kind of interesting combination of abilities here because of the, mm-hmm. like, you're like, okay, you're giving a toughness boost, but you're combining it with trample. And I think the art is kind of what ties it all together, where it's like, you're just bulldozing through with this giant shield. Um, and I, I like the idea that, um, Maybe you have a deck where you have like lots of like high toughness defender creatures, or like not defender, high toughness creatures, with maybe like two to three power, and you can just keep attacking and getting in damage because even though they have low power, um, you're kind of like if they try to if they don't block then whatever, if they do block then you're going to like hit them with the trample damage and you're going to survive because of the toughness, or like you can just put this in like maybe like a butt fighting deck where. It's suddenly the trample and the plus two, plus O, plus two are both relevant. Mm-hmm. I like this as a common. Um, I tend to really like when cards grant like reach and trample, despite the fact that that's never going to be relevant together. Even if plus O, plus two and trample aren't going to be relevant on the same turn in the same game, the fact that it can do kind of either or without without the cost is 
that's a fun thing uh, from my kind of point of view as a designer. I like it when it can, it's like, oh, I don't just have to optimize it by having that kind of like Doran, you're fighting with toughness type thing. That's really cool, but this can kind of function as a way to get a little bit of extra uh, reach through of damage and just a way to help bolster my high power, low toughness guys. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I could maybe see this as like, um, I know that in the set that this is in, it's the green white archetype, but I could also see this in like a green red thing where like you have, cause you, cause green red uh, sometimes has like those um, like four mana, four, two, something like mm-hmm. that. And this like, and this bolsters those. Absolutely. I also just want to shout out, you know, a good, it's easy during Moxtober to celebrate some of the really wild cards. And I love a, a nice clean common amongst all of that. I think it's a, a really fun idea and a different spin on Mithril than we're seeing in other mechanical spaces. Yeah, and I do this every day, but I'm going to do it again. Uh, shout out to Canterbury Egg, who is designing a whopping six cards per day and, um, and is making a whole set based off Moxtober. So, so today's uh, archetype was the green-white one for Mithril. So if you check out the MSC set file, you can see some more of those. But yeah, um, my next card is going to be... Oh no, I've lost it. Okay, there it is. Mithril Forge Master. Um, it's uh, one white and a blue. Uh, you can cast equipment spells as though they had flash. And whenever it enters a battlefield on your control, you can attach them to target creature you control. And equipped creatures have first strike? Like, whoof! So suddenly, um, your equipments are com- like your equipments are combat tricks plus is really strong. And I like that um, as an extension of, like, mithril things are light. So obviously that gives them flash because they're, or not obviously, but like, I think that's, that's one route you can take mechanically for like, oh yeah, it's, it's light so you can make it come down fast kind of thing. I kind of wonder whether this card itself wants flash. It's nice without it because it's only three abilities, which is a nice maximum. But what if you flash this in for three mana? It's turn six, you've got another three mana, you flash another equipment in and everything mid-combat. Uh, I'm just curious whether there's there's even more kind of edges to this card still able to be be pulled out from the rock. I think being sorcery speed helps like mitigate it a little bit because it is pretty powerful. But it's also like it's also a three mana do nothing on the turn it comes down a dual color card. So you could be right. I, I don't mean to say that this card is you know needs just power level increase, which which flash usually is. I'm just I'm like okay, well, like use, flash, use case wise, but it doesn't have flash, and. I don't know. It's, it's very silly to to want all things that grant flash to have flash, but that's my first kind of instinct. No, yeah, fair. Because then you can like, the, it makes it so that um, it it can't be like as telegraphed or like they can't kill it before combat. So you can do some cool stuff with it. This is probably a good balance, though. Of here's the creature who makes all of your things lighter weight and you know sturdier and sharper and everything. I. Uh, between flash and auto equip, that's a great. Okay, cool. It does that, and then first strike. Yeah, and it's extra sharp. Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder. Like, I think oh, like I think a cool deck that this could maybe make is like um, kind of like a mix between the Colossus Hammer Turbo decks that we're seeing right now and something more like old Cobblade, maybe. I think mm-hmm. that th- this could like enable that. So that would definitely be a deck I'd want to build in a format where this exists. I don't know if we'll ever see, you know, sort of Feast and Famine back, but it'd be fascinating just to see, okay, well, now I'm going to have six equipments out because I can cast them end of turn with Flash. And yeah, that would be fun. I think equipment is generally a fun thing to center wild, tricky other decks, you know, whether controller tempo decks around, because it, it allows a few more axes of interaction. While also making you like a little bit more resistant to interaction by like making it said, okay, you killed my threat, but my next thing is also going to be a threat. So I, I, sure. I, I like that. I, I like that a lot because it's like it it, encur- it encourages diversity or like flexibility in 
the removal that people run so they can also hit the equipment so and and so and that can only be a good thing because then you have like the trade-off of like the efficiency of just creature removal or the non-efficiency of more uh widespread removal so yeah always love that in metas Mm -hmm. okay we're edging towards the half an hour mark so i'm going to pull it to the section where oh sorry go ahead can i sneak one more in Sure, go ahead. I, I know I know we're a little long on time, but Mythos of Yagmoth, uh three Phyrexian white, Phyrexian black sorcery, return target non lion permanent from a graveyard to the battlefield if it's an artifact, or if white black was spent to cast this spell. I think using Phyrexian mana with the mythos if you know this was cast is a really fun idea. Oh yeah, like I was like, why does this name like clock to me? And it's like, oh yeah, it's like the mythos of a Luna uh, cycle from uh from my Coria. and mm-hmm. i love the idea of like yeah sure you, you can just get like an artifact reanimation but you can also just get back it like it feels very phyrexian so it, it it feels like the natural progression there so but yeah big fan of this the unfortunate thing that i run into with my own trying to you know figure out what's next for phyrexia is when you have two colors of phyrexian mana the reminder text is really weird so just in case you, you know, maybe maybe on a rare you you don't need the, but typically the Frexian reminder text is okay on one color and just real weird with two colors. Yeah, I think you can maybe get away with it uh, and just be like, people who are in the custom magic space will already know how this works. So I'm just going to sure. forgo reminder text and just let it ride. <laughs> totally. Okay. Now we can go to our cards. Cool, cool. So... Mine was, I have mentioned this in previous episodes, how I like to be a hipster, but today that was not to be. My idea was pretty much on board with what everyone else is doing. It's Mithril Guarantee. One in a white for an enchantment aura. You enchant an artifact and give it indestructible. And if it's an equipment, it also gains a clause which gives the equipped creature indestructible. So this was like, it was like a simple idea. I was actually surprised, like, I hadn't... I, I, I scryfalled it and I couldn't find it, so I was like, oh, okay. But yeah, I just felt like this was... Obviously, like, if you have an equipment, putting an aura onto that as well, it's a little bit too much of a cute combo, but I, I, I like this just in terms of simplicity. Yeah, totally. It, normally, you wouldn't ever really want to enchant your equipment to make your equipment better, but in this case, I mean, Indestructible is basically the only time you would want to do that. And it really makes sense as a whole package card together. Yep. Okay. You want to talk about your design? Sure. And in the words of Janet Clark, it's a doozy. Uh, this is Conclave Wolf Rider. It's for a single green or white mana creature elf knight with renown two. If Conclave Wolf Rider is renowned and would deal damage to a player, create a two, two white wolf creature token instead. And it's a 2-2 for a single mana. Oh boy, that is strong. Like, when I was typing this up, I was like, did I, did I, did I misread something? No? Oh, 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 okay. Oh, it's, it's really strong. But like, I think that, like you mentioned in the channel, like, um, it not dealing damage beyond the first trigger allows you to kind of like mitigate some of that. But also, like, it just kind of efficiently kills their creatures, so it's hard to deal with creature-wise. And if the, if they get to swing in a second time, the, you start to build up a board really quickly. So it's still scary, TM. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite things to keep really trying to figure out the right balance for is if creature would deal damage to a player effect instead equal to you know the damage that would be dealt. In this case, it doesn't scale to the damage but it is kind of based on well this has to be a 4-4 in order to be creating two twos but it'll never deal four damage to an opponent because of the instead yep and like flavor wise okay first of all i love the flavor text while boros battalions f- fight in phalanxes the knight of celestia the knights of celestia prefer to ride in packs and i also i just love the idea of like this like this wolf rider gets in once and then like the, all the other wolves are like holy shit have you heard about that wolf rider person like kind of crazy and they just come out in droves yeah i am willing to concede that this might need to be a two mana two two renowned two with a token making ability but 
I think it's on the edge. I think it's worth worth trying. It's I mean, it, test, like it's, it's spicy always... by turn six, but you can have one mana cards that are spicy on turn six. Like that's a that's a thing that is usually safe. Mm-hmm. And and testing resources exist, so for sure. Mm-hmm. I look forward to if I can get. Un- I'm not sure whether there's going to be other renown triggers with damage replacement. Uh, that might be a well not worth going back to in the same jumpstart pack. But this plus a lure that you can put on a wolf or something, or a lure that you can put on this once it's a 4-4 four four to demand it is blocked, is that's fun either way. Oh yeah, that starts because when, when you can like make it, or like just a fight spell in general, just makes it mm-hmm. real scary. Yeah. But yeah, I think with that, we can wrap up this episode. So thank you for joining me, Juliet. Um, so Thanks for having me. Tomorrow's video, which is topical for the for Conclave Wolf Rider, the prompt is going to be Rider, so stay tuned for that. Um, on today, October 9th, when this video comes out, the prompt is Tyrant. So uh, if you're making a card on Twitter, tag it with MTG Moxtober. If you're making it elsewhere, tag it with MTG Moxtober or Moxtober. Um, I'll be looking through mtg.design, Reddit, uh, the, the custom magic Reddit, the custom magic server, MSE server, and beacon of creation server. So post a card there. I'll collect it and put it in the MSE file, and we might talk about it. Um, but yeah, until then, this is Caillou signing off. <laughs>